Dear intercessors, the title for my message this week is The Festival of Light. I hope you will find this exciting. And I will begin as a background to read from uh, the book of Revelation, chapter 22 and verse 12 and 13. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. So here we see that Yeshua Jesus is specifically connected with the beginning and the end. The truth is that uh, <clears throat> just as the church began, as we can read it in the book of Acts, and there was such a breakthrough of the gospel that happened in the first century, <clears throat> we saw the, or we can read about the glory of God that was among the early believers. He, that was the beginning when... <clears throat> Jesus was manifest in the church in such a powerful way. But he is not only the beginning, he is also the end. And we can be sure that as the church, the uh, assembly of the followers of Messiah, as it began, it will also end. He is the beginning and he is the end. And uh, <clears throat> we can see that... Uh, when we read in the book of Acts, it all began in Jerusalem. And in the same way, the gospel is going to have its full climax in Jerusalem when Yeshua returns to set his feet on the Mount of Olives and then to sit down on the throne of his father David to rule the nations out from the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. So that is when the gospel has gone first a full circle around the world. And uh, there, <clears throat> there will be the same manifestation of the glory of God in the end, we are convinced, as it was in the beginning. And uh, I want to read to you a um, summary, you can say, of 2,000 years of church history. Uh, listen to this. It began as a revival movement among the Jewish people in Jerusalem. It then became a philosophy in Greece, an institution in Rome, a culture in Europe, and a business in America. Well, that's oversimplified. I am sure you understand that. But it shows you how the gospel has traveled through different cultures and received, uh, took in an influence from the surroundings uh, of the environment around uh, in, the, in the cultures where the gospel has penetrated. But we can be sure that just as it began, it will also end. And uh, one thing that we see uh, in the book of Acts is that it was a um, triumphant church, but it was also a persecuted church. And in the same way, we believe that the gospel is going to triumph in the end times, just as it did in the beginning, but it will also be in confrontation with uh, persecution and suffering, just as it was in the beginning. However, there is one thing <clears throat> that we do not find in the book of Acts, and that I want to talk about this time of year, and that is Christmas. Christmas is, was not in the book of Acts, nor is it in the Bible, period. The celebration of the birth of Messiah on December 25 is something that happened much later in church history. In fact, I want to read a quote from a, um, a web page that is called uh, the, uh, uh, it's called actually the um, Bible Question 
dot com and in in it's in Swedish but I've translated it into English. Uh and we're going to look here at the question when did the Christmas celebration uh, begin and why is it celebrated uh, on December 25. But I want to read before I do uh, look at this this issue uh, a prophetic word that came uh, through a servant of the Lord this week, which was uh, actually past Sunday, uh, December 11, 2022, in one of the largest churches in Sweden, the Word of Life Church in Uppsala. I want to have this as a background because... It is a very, very serious word that uh, shows us that we are now standing at crossroads. In fact, I believe that we are standing on the threshold of the final stage of the church to be restored back again to what it was in the beginning. Look, we are not looking back to Constantinople or Rome or even Wittenberg and the Reformation, or Azusa Street, or Tulsa, or anything, what we're looking toward is Jerusalem. That's where it began, and that's where it also will end. And we're now standing at crossroads, uh, making where we have to make a choice if we are going to obey God's word, or if we are going to go with uh, the thoughts uh, of man. So this is the very serious word that came forth, and I want to read it to you. Yes, says the Lord, I have a word for my people in this country. It is uh, referring to Sweden, but it is is, uh, applicable to the entire world. Not least, says the Lord, to my shepherds, you are at a crossroads. There is a path where you can walk with me forward into a time of victory, of breakthrough, of joy. But you must walk through a gate first in the Spirit, and that gate has a name. It's called humility. And you say, haven't we humbled ourselves? Have we not bowed our knees, says the Lord? Yes, of course you have. But now I'm not talking about external humility. I speak of the humility of the heart. True humility is obedience to me, the holy God, and my word. Yes, behold, I will send my servants the prophets. I'm going to raise them up in place after place. They do not bow, says the Lord, for this prince of the world, whom many of you honor, says the Lord, and has uh, has such an easy time listening to. My prophets, they listen to me. They fear nothing except me. They will speak my words. Yes, they will not be well received everywhere. No, says the Lord, They will be accused of dividing congregations. They will be accused of disturbing peace. But that's not genuine peace. Yes, says the Lord, they will even be hated by some because they will reveal works of darkness. But, says the Lord, my spirit will rest upon them and I will protect them. And let me comment here. This is something that we need to take responsibility for in prayer, to pray for these prophetic voices to arise, to speak the word of God faithfully, calling the church back to uh, repentance. And this word uh, about uh, the, the, the gate uh, called humility, this is in line with the prayer movement Nordic 714 based on Second Chronicles 714, which begins with the very word humility. If my people which are called by my name will humble themselves. That's the gate into what is ahead for God's people. Humility before the Lord and his word. So let's continue with this prophetic word. So now I speak to you. 
not least to you shepherds, says the Lord. I give you a choice to bow before me because I love you and I want my people to be led forward. But if you do not bow, says the Lord, places will stand deserted. Yes, not just deserted, but become places influenced by evil spirits. People will walk past these places and say, how could this happen? How was that possible? Well, says the Lord, because they did not bow before me. Yes, says the Lord, if you do not bow, you shepherds who do not bow now, who do not listen to me, I will take the shepherd's staff away from you in humiliation. I will put the shepherd's staff with those who humble themselves before me, who are worthy to lead my people forward, says the Lord. So listen to my words, for they will come to pass, says the Lord. How we need to intercede for the shepherds to make the true choice in this hour so that they can lead God's people forward, forward into the destiny that God has for us, to be restored back to our origins, to our roots, that began in Jerusalem and that will con, uh, also uh, have its climax and its fulfillment uh, ultimately in Jerusalem with the coming of the Messiah. So we're living on a threshold now to the uh, a new era that will make uh, such a difference between life and death, between glory and apostasy. We have spoken about this many times in previous messages. So <clears throat> now we will come to the question of Christmas. And this might be uh, not so easy for some of you to receive. And I, I appeal to you to humbly uh, test this before the Lord, go to him and, and just uh, ask him if this is truly from him or not. As I said, a Christmas celebration on December 25 is not something that we find in the Bible. So, where did it begin and when? Here's the answer to that question here from this very well-known website. During the first 300 years of the history of the Christian Church, no one celebrated the birth of Yeshua Jesus whatsoever. The reason was primarily threefold. Firstly, the date for the birth of Yeshua is not given anywhere in the Bible. Secondly, in the Bible only wicked people celebrated their birthdays. And thirdly, in the pagan Roman Empire, which was occupying Israel at the time of the beginning of the church, there was a common tradition to celebrate the birthdays of the pagan gods. So those three reasons uh, is why there were no celebration uh, for at least 300 years in the church of the birth of Jesus. At the time of the birth of Jesus, the Roman Empire included almost all of Europe and the Middle East. In Rome, the great god was called Saturn. In the middle of the winter, there was a long celebration held in his honor, and this feast was called Saturnalia and lasted from December 17 to 24. It was a feast when one ate and drank, gathered friends together, and gave gifts to one another. Dwe December 25th was the last and greatest day of Saturnalia. During the first 300 years of the Roman Empire, sun worship had begun to spread from the east, from Syria and Persia, and reached large parts of the empire. Already in ancient Babylon, people had worshipped the sun. One of the highest deities among the Babylonians was the sun god Shamash. The most important day in the solar religion was the day when the sun was, quote, born again, end quote, and rose in the heavens after he had been, it had been sinking closer to the horizon and the days had become shorter and shorter in the fall and early winter. 
When the winter solstice occurred on December 25, it was celebrated with a great feast. Eastern philosophers and mystics preached about the divine nature of the sun, and immigrants from the East brought their faith to the West. This resulted in the solar religion getting ever more followers in the Roman Empire. Then it happened that a Roman emperor emperor won a great military victory after praying to the sun god for victory. As a thank you, he elevated the invisible sun, Sol Invictus, above all the other gods of Rome. In the year 273, Common Era, he had a magnificent temple built for the sun. This temple was dedicated on the birthday of the sun, December 25. Barely 50 years later, the Roman Empire Constantine became an an inherent of the Christian doctrine. He was a former sun worshipper, and the new religion presented a problem. What should he do with the annual feast for the sun? To begin with, the church tried to have him ban the sun religion and its December festival. But he refused. If he banned the popular feast, conflicts could arise between the followers of different religions. Finally, a compromise was made. December 25 was the winter solstice, the day when the sun was born again. Why not transfer the worship of the masses from the sun god to the sun of righteousness, the light of the world? Christ. It was easy to illustrate the symbolic connection. If one Christianized the festival of the sun god by instead celebrating the birth of Jesus on that day, perhaps conflict could be avoided. In addition, many people would automatically join the new religion, just changing God for the worship. Consequently, the Romans were allowed to continue celebrating the large feast on December 25, but the sun god was removed and replaced with Christ instead. And once Rome had accepted December 25 as the birthday of Jesus, there was no difficulty for the feast to spread to the rest of the Roman Empire. In Constantinople, they started to celebrate Christmas in the year 380, in Asia Minor in 382, in Egypt around 430, and in Jerusalem around the year 440. This spread up through Europe, where the Sun Turning Feast had been celebrated since ancient times in most of the countries. Also in the far north, something called Yule, still the Swedish name for Christmas today, a midwinter feast was celebrated. The word Yule, some claim, comes from the Anglo-Saxon Hjul, which means wheel, symbolic of the divine sun and its path around the earth, as they uh, imagined in those days. The Icelandic author Snorre Sturlason wrote in the beginning of the 12th century of how the pagan northerners used to celebrate three large sacrificial feasts, among them the midwinter blut, uh, blute, or the sun-turning feast, when they would sacrifice in order to receive a favorable crop. When Christianity arrived, the ancient northern Yule was Christianized, and ever since then, we have continued to celebrate the birth of Jesus on December 25, also in Northern Europe. So, this uh, that the church adopted in the 4th century, uh, uh, the holiday of Christmas also was an expression of a larger paradigm shift, a process of intentionally cutting itself off from its Jewish roots, and God's own calendar in order to establish a separate identity and gain cultural influence in Rome. So this is historic. Uh, these are historic facts. Um, there, is, uh, there is no doubt that, that this is uh, the true 
origins of <clears throat> Christmas, but uh, that it is uh, a pagan festival that has been Christianized. Let's look at what the Word of God has to say about this. In Deuteronomy chapter 12, we're going to read the final verses there. Um, the heading of the entire chapter is the true place of worship. And the final portion here from verse 29 is a warning against idolatry. Now, I just want to say this and emphasize it very strongly. There are only two specific sins that the, the writers of the New Testament, the apostles, warned uh, also all um, uh, Gentile believers to not only avoid, but to flee from two sins. And number one, sexual immorality. Flee away from sexual immorality. Do not have anything connected with uh, to, uh, that is connected with sexual immorality uh, in your life. And the second thing is idolatry. Flee from idolatry, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So this section now, warning against idolatry, is very much uh, pertinent also for Christians in the new covenant. I read here from verse 29. When the Lord your God cuts off before you the nations whom you go in to dispossess, and you dispossess them and dwell in their land. Verse 30, take care that you be not ensnared to follow them after they have been destroyed before you, and that you do not inquire about their gods, saying, how did these nations serve their gods, that I also may do the same? You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. In other words, in the way that the pagans worship idols. Uh, <clears throat> abominable thing, let's read again here. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. For every abominable thing that the Lord hates, they have done for their gods. For they even burned their gods and their daughters in the fire to their gods. Everything that I commanded you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add to it or take away from it. So here we are warned to not celebrate or worship God, the true God, the creator of heaven and earth, the God and Father of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah, Jesus Christ, should not be worshipped in the way that the pagans worship their idols. And yet, when it comes to Christmas, almost all the uh, customs associated with Christmas have their pagan origins. The Christmas tree, for instance, it's pagan in its origin, doesn't come from the Bible. The, uh, uh, the reindeer, the, the uh, uh, mistletoe, uh, even the Christmas gifts come from the Saturnalia uh, celebration when they gave gifts to one another. Now, it's not wrong to give gifts, but this pagan roots to Christmas is something that, uh, based on the Word of God, is not pleasing to the Lord. And what I say here is not something that is new. This has been uh, repeated throughout church history by, by many others. Even uh, some of the church fathers in the fourth century objected to celebrate the birth of Jesus based on a pagan holiday. And certainly during the Reformation, especially I know about Martin Luther, he refused to, uh, he banned Christmas in the beginning saying this is a completely pagan Catholic tradition that we should not uh, hold to. However, because of pressure, uh, Martin Luther changed his mind. He even in the end began to call the Christmas tree the tree of life. So uh, the um, 
the forbidding Christmas celebration did not last long in the Reformation. And that's why the Protestants are also following the Catholic tradition that started in Rome to celebrate the birth of Jesus on December 25. The Puritans that came to America, they uh, forbade uh, the celebration of Christmas in the early, uh, in the colonies uh, at the beginning. But then later on, it was accepted once again. Because, uh, and I want to give you another example as well, the famous Bible teacher, Watchman Nee in China, he was uh, adamantly against Christmas uh, celebrations. He, he he was very much in favor of unity among all believers in Jesus. However, he said, we cannot have fellowship with those who observe Christmas. It's a non-biblical feast, and uh, it is not something that, that brings God honor. So um, this is not something new that it has been objected to in church history before. However, it is it has been proven basically impossible to end this uh, ancient uh, celebration in on December 25, except you have an alternative. And thank God this time of year there is an alternative that is in uh, many ways a direct... Um, uh, in opposition, you should say, with uh, opposing uh, worship of idols and, and pagan rituals. And that is the biblical Jewish feast of Hanukkah. Hanukkah was a feast, uh, it means the dedication, uh, feast of dedication. It was a feast uh, that Yeshua, Jesus, celebrated. We can read about this in John chapter 10. Uh, Jesus went to Jerusalem on uh, all the feasts, uh, on Passover. Uh, the disciples, we know, they were in, commanded even to be in Jerusalem on Pentecost. And Jesus and, and his followers came to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. We know that. But also, many people are not so... Uh, or Christians do not know that Yeshua Jesus also came to celebrate Hanukkah uh, all the way from Galilee to Jerusalem in the middle of the winter. We read in John chapter 10, verse 22, At that time the feast of dedication, Hanukkah, took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. Uh, so we know that Jesus, he did uh, celebrate this feast when the temple was rededicated or in honor of the rededication of the temple back to God after it had been desecrated by the forces of the evil uh, emperor uh, Ant uh, Antiochus Epiphanes. And uh, <clears throat> this is something that was prophesied by the prophet Daniel, that it would happen. And uh, it is something that is also referred to in the great eschatological speech of Yeshua Jesus in Matthew 24, when he quotes this passage from Daniel about the, the uh, desecration of the temple. So let's read first the passage from Daniel in uh, chapter 11, verse 31 and 32, which is uh, the prophecy about what happened during Hanukkah. It says, uh, I'm jumping right into the story here uh, about uh, in the prophecy about Antiochus Epiphanes, who, by the way, is the main prototype of the end time antichrist uh, both Yeshua Jesus referred to this passage talking about the antichrist and Paul as well in 2nd Thessalonians chapter 2 let's read here forces from him Antiochus Epiphanes that is shall appear and profane the temple and fortress and shall take away the regular burnt offering and they shall set up the abomination that makes desolate. This is what Jesus is referring to in Matthew 24, when uh, it, it says in verse 15, 
Um, I want to read that here. Matthew 24, 15. So when you see, this is uh, talking about the signs about the coming or the return of Jesus. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains and so on. So, in other words, what happened during Hanukkah is a prophecy of something that is going to happen in the end times. And what was it that happened? Well, this Greek Syrian emperor Antiochus Epiphanes, he hated God. He hated the worship of God. He hated the word of God. And he wanted to have everyone in his domain to be Hellenized, to worship the gods of the the Greeks. And so he forbade the Jewish people to worship God in the temple. He forbade them to keep the Sabbath, to keep the, keep the uh, dietary laws, to even to study the word of God. They were not allowed to do that. And he began to force them to sacrifice to idols instead. If he had succeeded, and now this is very, very important to notice. If he had succeeded, or rather if the rebellion against him had not succeeded, Jesus could not have been born as the Son of God because his parents would have been pagans. They would not have been uh, a true worshipers of God. They would not have been carrying him into the temple to dedicate him to God and to do unto him what the law prescribes. The word of God could not have been fulfilled. He came at the right time, Paul says in Galatians 4, born of a woman, born under the law. In other words, coming in obedience to the law. That would have been impossible, and that was if Antiochus Epiphanes had had his way. But thank God, God gave the victory through some people who stayed faithful to the Word of God. And that's what it says in the next verse. Uh, <clears throat> verse 32, or the end of verse 31 once again, And they shall set up the abomination that makes desolate. He, that is the Antichrist, ultimately, but here is also talking about Antiochus Epiphanes, he shall seduce with flattery those who violate the covenant. In other words, here we see a picture of the great apostasy, the falling away that is going to take place because the Antichrist is going to deceive so many, seduce them into... Um, violating the word of God. But, here it comes, the people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. In the King James it says they shall do exploits. And that's what the people who had faith in God and stayed faithful to him during this um, Antichrist in figure uh, takeover of the land of Israel and the land of Judah and in those days there was a people a faithful remnant that withstood that apostasy and that eventually got the victory over these uh, evil forces and they could come back to Jerusalem return to Jerusalem and to the temple and rededicate it unto God and it is this victory that is celebrated until this very day among the Jewish people, the return uh, to establish the true worship of God. And that is the battle that we are faced with in the end times. And that's why this um, uh, feast of dedication, Hanukkah, is so prophetic for the end times. It, and it has so much of uh, encouragement, guidance, and inspiration for us to oppose, to flee away from idolatry and stay true to the Word of God. And I want to read uh, what uh, the uh, song that is sung during Hanukkah today among the Jewish people. 
uh, when they light the Hanukkah candles uh, in the uh, it's a special candle uh, or candle holder that's called the Hanukkia. It has actually nine candles. It's not the seven uh, armed menorah that was uh, in the temple, but it is a, a different kind of uh, menorah, you can say, or or, or a candle uh, holder, which with nine lights. It has one in the middle called the servant, which is lit first, and then that is the light that lights all the other candles. And it's a picture of the Messiah as the light of the world who is giving light unto us to become lights of the world. There's so much prophetic revelation there. And when the Jewish people, uh, uh, they light these candles, they sing also a song during Hanukkah, and I give the English translation here, O mighty stronghold of my salvation, to, to praise you is a delight. Restore my house of prayer. How prophetic for us that we can rededicate us, ourselves, that is, to become a house of prayer during this time, to withstand the forces of lawlessness, of uh, apostasy, and to stay faithful and true to God. Restore my house of prayer, and there will we bring a thanksgiving offering when you will eliminate our enemies. Then I shall complete with a song of him the dedication of the altar. Well, we have uh, a ministry of dedication that is described by Paul in Romans chapter 12, that is so uh, fitting for this time of year. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and, uh, and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So we are to lay down our lives on the altar before God to rededicate our lives to him and so that we can become a house of prayer. Uh, let me say, I'm going to read verse 2 here in a moment as well, that what happened to me and my wife and my family when God called us to prayer in 1977. The f first thing we did uh, was actually two things. Number one, we decided to throw out the television set from our home because we, we realized that it's going to steal time from prayer to God. It is going to uh, make it very difficult for us to be faithful in prayer. And the second thing was we decided to stop celebrating Christmas. Why? Because Christmas is a time when you become so very busy with material things and uh, it's so much of uh, fleshly indulgence, you can say, with all of the foods that until you, most people actually get sick from all the food. So we decided instead for several years, we spent the Christmas season in fasting and prayer. Because we realized that it was a time of year when most Christians were not praying. They were busy with other things. So this was without knowing anything about the Feast of Dedication, Hanukkah. We were not uh, influenced by that at all. This was in 1977. We had never heard about Hanukkah. But we decided we wanted to stop celebrating Christmas because we saw that this was something that was hindering us from uh, fulfilling our calling uh, to pray. Now, I want to say to you that uh, it's possible to uh, honor God uh, in, in if you have a pure heart of of wanting to thank Him during Christmas for giving us uh, the Savior, for sending Him, and so on. And uh, to a certain extent, God can honor that. But if you if you do want to keep that up. I, I really appeal to you to remove as much of the pagan 
uh, customs from the celebration as possible and uh, to focus uh, completely on uh, worship to God uh, and in thanksgiving for giving us his son. Uh, but uh, I believe that there is a more uh, honorable to God way of uh, of uh, celebrating the coming of the Messiah when he was born. And this is, we can see a pattern of this in the Hanukkah. But most of all, it is a pattern for us for the end times and the battle against apostasy. That is what the main lesson of Hanukkah is, to rededicate our lives to be pure before him and to become a house of prayer. And it says in verse 2 here in Romans 12, which is so fitting, do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And let me repeat, it's going to end in the same way as it began. There were no Christmas celebrations in the early church, not, never in the book of Acts. You don't find that in the entire Bible. It is man-made uh, traditions actually that has its root in paganism. And so um, I want to just give some some, uh, points here that you can think about when you test this message to see if this is something that maybe God would speak to you about. And um, I do want to put in... uh, something here uh, of a detail that I think is important. Uh, Do it in a way that is in unity with your family, or otherwise it can become very uh, problematic. I don't think it's worth it to to become a a division in the family over this thing. But if you can, together as a family, begin to adopt more biblical um, traditions during this time of year, I do encourage you to do that. Here are one of the, uh, um, or five, um, things to think about when it comes to Christmas. First of all, um, that many unbelievers, especially in the Nordic countries, it might be different in America, but uh, most people, they are aware of the pagan origins of Christmas and how it is actually Christians who have stolen a pagan holiday from the beginning. So this talk about putting Jesus back into Christmas is kind of, um, it, it, it gives a bad testimony. We should leave that celebration to those who do not believe in, in God if they want to follow pagan traditions. But if we want to worship God in a biblical and God-honoring way, we should stay away from uh, pagan traditions. So it gives us, we're, it gives an impression that we have a religion that is not truly original and sincere when we uh, celebrate Christmas, which is from the beginning a pagan holiday. Uh, the second thing to think about is that no one, in, as I said in the New Testament or uh, any of the apostles or in the early centuries, immediately following uh, the birth of Yeshua celebrated Christmas. So why should we? Why do we need something outside of the Bible? Number three is that uh, Christmas is so much um, connected with materialism and uh, obesity, indulgence, <clears throat> and number four, uh, this I've touched on before, is that aside from the gospel story about the birth of uh, of Jesus, uh, basically, or almost every Christian tradition and custom uh, has pagan roots. And number five, the dark principalities that um, were once celebrated. Uh, during this time with a special uh, feast and a special worship, they are still very much uh, alive today and they connect to these pagan uh, traditions. And uh, the final thing here is that uh, why 
is it that so many Christians do not uh, think it's strange why many people who are even opposed to the gospel or do not believe in God at all are so eager to celebrate Christmas? That should show us that it's it's really not uh, in its origin something that is from the Bible. So um, I also want to read another um, poem here, or actually um, it is a prayer of thanksgiving among the Jewish people in connection with all the meals during Hanukkah, because it explains why this feast is celebrated. Listen to this. After uh, every meal during Hanukkah, when you give thanks to God for the food, the following thanksgiving is also made. In the days of Matityahu, the son of Yohanan the high priest, the Hasmonean and his sons, when the wicked Hellenic government rose up against your people Israel to make them forget your Torah and violate the decrees of your will, But you, in your abounding mercies, stood by them in the time of their distress. You waged their battles, defended their rights, and avenged the wrong done to them. You delivered the mighty into the hands of the weak, the many into the hands of the few, the impure into the hands of the pure, the wicked into the hands of the righteous." and the wanton sinners into the hands of those who occupy themselves with your word, your Torah. You made a great and holy name for yourself in your world and effected a great deliverance and redemption for your people Israel to this very day. Then your children entered the shrine of your house, cleansed your temple, purified your sanctuary, kindled lights in your holy courtyards, and instituted these eight days of Hanukkah to give thanks and praise to your great name. Hallelujah. So why should Christians celebrate Hanukkah? Let me give you five reasons. The first one is that the miracles of the Hanukkah, the rededication of the temple, made it possible (laughs) for the Son of God to be born into the world. I've already mentioned that. So it's part of the story. Without the Hanukkah victory, Jesus could not have been born uh, because he was to be born exactly as it was prophesied. God has no plan B. It has to be exactly as it was spoken of him. And number two, Hanukkah, is the story of victory over apostasy and lawlessness that will be repeated in the last days, in the end times. That's why it is such a um, pertinent feast also for us to be strengthened and inspired to wage this battle against apostasy and idolatry. I want to quote the final words of the Apostle John in his first uh, epistle when he says, Children, Stay away, beware of the idols. Number, reason number three why Hanukkah is, uh, should be celebrated among Christians. We are the temple of the Lord and need to dedicate our lives to be ready for the second coming of Messiah. This is a time of year of rededication of our lives to God in a special way. Number four, we can celebrate that the Word became flesh during uh, this time because many there are many reasons to believe that Yeshua the Messiah was born during the feasts in the fall, which means that probably the new temple was dedicated inside of the womb of Mary, Miriam, during Hanukkah. And I want to us to read from John, the Gospel of John, uh, and we see here about the light of the world that was coming, and that light sort of came as the seed supernaturally into the womb of Miriam during this time of year, most likely. We don't know 100% sure, but there are so many things that I could point to that show us that this is something we can remember during this time of 
the dedication of the temple. Yeshua, the temple is a picture of Yeshua the Messiah and his body. He is the true temple of God, even though it doesn't replace the physical temple in Jerusalem. Let me read here in John chapter 1 from verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Listen, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. This is the festival of lights that is pointing to Yeshua the Messiah, Jesus, who is the light of the world, the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. So the light of the world can be celebrated during the festival of lights because probably this is when uh, that seed came into the Virgin uh, during this time. Now the fifth and final reason I want to give here why Christians should celebrate Hanukkah is that the Bible teaches us that we who are believers in Jesus, Yeshua, we have been grafted in among the Jewish people in their own cultivated olive tree. And so uh, the, the history of the Jewish people is our history, and it's part of our salvation history. And as I said, without the victory during Hanukkah, we could not celebrate the birth of Yeshua the Messiah. And Paul calls uh, the people of Israel our fathers in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1. And in Romans 15 and 10, Paul says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And we can certainly do that during this time of year in celebrating the true light of the world coming into the world during the Festival of Lights. And at the same time, we give our lives afresh and anew on the altar of God to rededicate our lives to become a house of prayer and to stay faithful and true to Him. I believe that we are coming back to where it all began. We're coming back to the true roots of our faith that began in Jerusalem. It will end there as well for the people who are being, who have been made ready to receive Him when He returns to His people in Jerusalem. I hope you have learned something during this study. I have only touched on it so briefly. There is so much that you can learn from this. You can go to the internet and read about Hanukkah, and you can see the prophetic uh, inspiration that this festival is for us today in uh, the situation we are in. And also, you can use this time to pray for God's chosen people, Israel, uh, because God is going to restore them uh, before the coming of the Messiah as well to be ready to meet him. Hallelujah. Let's give thanks unto God. Father, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you that it is uh, the, uh, a light unto our path and that the word is the light uh, and the word that became flesh is the light of the world that we can celebrate during the festival of lights. We pray that we will become true lights in this world that will shine in the darkness and become uh, powerful testimonies for you as we stay uh, clean and pure from the influence of this world. Uh, and certainly from all, everything that is connected with idolatry. Restore us, O God, to become a pure and holy temple to you and that we can also become a house of prayer together, corporately, but also individually as our bodies are the temples of the Lord. I pray that you will bless each and every one uh, and draw 
each and every one who has listened to this message even closer to you and to your word in these dark days. Thank you that, uh, that you have called us to become light that shines in the darkness. In Yeshua's Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you and uh, thank you for listening. Uh, give everything to God. Rededicate your life once again to Him during this time and commit to become a house of prayer. God bless you.